The European Journal of Neuroscience is a society journal for the Federation of European Neuroscience Societies. It's your journal. It's the place uh, where many people in the world community come to publish good, solid, well-conducted, rigorous science. The societies rep represent the collective view of the scientific community um, and also the manner in which they view publishing at that point in time. And I think that's very important because publishing is a changing situation. Every second year for the FENS Neuroscience uh, meeting, we have a, a Young Investigator Award and a Senior Investigator Award. And it's a way for the European Journal of Neuroscience to partner with its society, uh, Federation of European Neuroscience Societies, FENS, uh, to recognize outstanding work by an established figure in the field and by an up and coming, super exciting youngster who's just blazing a trail. These awards, they are actually sponsored by Wiley, um, the um, uh, publisher of uh, EJN and um, uh, given uh, by a committee from FENS. And uh, these, these awards are here to uh, recognize uh, outstanding contrib contributions in neuroscience. Recognition or highlighting of specific work done by an individual opens up that work to a larger and broader audience that may or may not otherwise get to see it. Is the recognition of your own community to the work you do. So is a specific and very special recognition is uh, your colleagues telling you that you are doing a great job. Our senior award winner this year is Seth Grant. And in some ways, Seth really embodies every aspect of, of what you want to see in, in the senior awardee for the EJN FENS uh, prize. Uh, he's a senior researcher who's made fundamental contributions uh, to our understanding of the mechanisms of behavior uh, and how those mechanisms are involved in brain disease. Uh, he's based in Edinburgh uh, and FENS this year, of course, comes to you virtually from Glasgow. So it was a, a, a fantastic year to have somebody based at, at a major Scottish university uh, while FENS was being hosted by the Scots. Uh, he represents... Uh, the incredible international breadth of the FENS community he hails uh, and did his original work in Australia. Um, and uh, what I love is that uh, the title of his talk this year uh, is very exciting because I think we're going to be taken on a, on a really wide scoping journey of, of a great body of work, uh, the synaptome, an epic journey in time and space. Having given talks at FENS over many years, it's a very special thing to be recognised by your peers for the body of work that one has accumulated over, over so many years. So, the, yeah, that means a great deal to me personally, but also I consider it a very important thing for all those people who have had the privilege to work with because it's not just me who does this work. I've had the privilege of wonderful postdocs and graduate students. Some of them have been extremely innovative and have done very important uh, contributions to all of this work. Uh, and so I think this is really an award uh, to them as well. Good morning. I'm Vidita Vaidya. I'm a senior editor of the European Journal of Neuroscience. It is my pleasure and privilege to introduce to you today, Professor Seth Grant, the recipient of the FENS EJN Award, for his outstanding contribution to our understanding of the complexity and diversity of the synapse, the essential unit of all neuronal communication. Professor Seth Grant received his bachelor's in science in physiology, medicine, and surgery from Sydney University. Following that, he did his postdoctoral work at the Cold Spring Harbor Labs in the US and then at Columbia University with Professor Eric Kandel. He moved to the University of Edinburgh and is now a professor of molecular neuroscience at the University of Edinburgh. He has also spent a period of time at the Wellcome Trust Sanger Institute in Cambridge, and he holds an honorary professorship at the University of Cambridge. Professor Seth Grant is a fellow of the Royal Society of Edinburgh and a fellow of the Academy of Medical Sciences. Professor Grant will speak to us today about the synaptome, an epic journey in time and space. His tour de force work in understanding the synapse is amongst the most beautiful of the omics approaches, certainly for the neuroscience community. 
His group's work has provided single synapse resolution molecular maps across the brain and uncovered the synapse diversity across brain circuits. This work has provided profound insights into the manner in which the compositional signatures of synapses vary across the lifespan, organizing with development and disorganizing with age. It is my pleasure and privilege to invite Professor Seth Grant to give his Penn's EJN award lecture. Professor Grant. I am delighted to deliver this lecture today, and it's a privilege to receive the FENS EJN Award. Understanding the fundamental molecular mechanisms of behavior is one of the most important problems in science today. Humans, animals, and indeed all cellular organisms adapt and respond to their environment, and the brain is an organ that is specialized for this purpose. The human brain is often described as the most complex object in the universe, and synapses are the hallmark of this complexity. In the late 19th century, Cajal identified synapses as the connections between neurons and proposed that each behavior uses a circuit of connected neurons, and that modifying the strength of synapses could be a mechanism for learning. By 1990, pharmacological data had suggested molecular models of excitatory synapses in which two neurotransmitter receptors, the AMPA receptor uh, for synaptic transmission and the NMDA receptor for plasticity, and a kinase that links them could then explain all of the key physiological properties of behavior. The postsynaptic terminal was considered to be a simple kind of device. However, in 2000, at the FENS meeting in Brighton, I presented the surprising discovery that showed there were tenfold more proteins attached to the NMDA receptor than previously known. These proteins were isolated in large macromolecular complexes with neurotransmitter receptors, scaffold proteins, adhesion, signaling, and cytoskeletal proteins forming molecular machines. We thought that there must be more postsynaptic proteins and continued our, pro our proteomic studies and systematically analyzed the postsynaptic proteome of excitatory synapses in humans, mouse, zebrafish, and drosophila. This expanded the number of proteins another tenfold, and we now know there are over 1,000 types of protein that are highly conserved in the postsynaptic terminal of excitatory synapses in all vertebrate species. This remarkable molecular complexity led us to ask, how are all of these proteins interacting with one another? And using phosphoproteomic studies, we showed that the postsynaptic proteins were linked in complicated signaling networks in which many kinases modify hundreds of phosphorylation sites on substrate proteins, modifying their function and protein-protein interactions. This shows that the synapse contains highly complex molecular machinery for processing the incoming signals from neurotransmitters. This ushered in the view that synapses are not simple devices or switches, but highly sophisticated computational devices. A second key principle is that the proteins are not freely floating in a soup, but are physically organized into multi-protein complexes. These are the building blocks of synapses. The composition of these complexes is determined by a molecular hierarchy. The genome encodes mRNAs, which encode the proteins, that are then physically assembled into complexes and supercomplexes. There are a large number of protein complexes in synapses, and most remain unstudied. But what do these complexes do? The first insight came from our knockout mouse study, where we found PSD95, a highly abundant scaffold protein that assembles the complexes, was essential for short and long-term synaptic plasticity and for learning. Synapses are exquisitely sensitive to the temporal patterns of stimuli, and the general picture that has arisen from physiological studies of dozens of postsynaptic proteins is that the postsynaptic complexes integrate activity patterns. They read time. So for example, this pattern 
of action potentials produces postsynaptic responses of varying amplitude. Using systematic phenotyping in over 50 lines of mutant mice carrying postsynaptic mutations, we found that the magnitude of each behavioral response is governed by different combinations of postsynaptic proteins. Thus, it is clear that the postsynaptic proteome complexity is crucial for controlling the animal's repertoire of innate and learned behaviours. We can now consider this new molecular model of behaviour alongside the traditional cellular and circuit model. And in considering this, it led us to ask how can these two models be unified into a more powerful and holistic model? Now to link these two models, we reasoned that the molecular logic of the hierarchical assembly of the postsynaptic proteome might extend to circuit anatomy, and that we needed to fill in the gap between complexes and circuits. And here I will summarize some of our findings. The complexes, the building blocks of synapses, are differentially distributed to produce diverse synapse types. There is in fact a very high synapse diversity in the brain, which we now describe by the term the synaptome. But the synapse types are not randomly distributed, but instead are spatially organized into a synaptome architecture observed within the dendritic tree of individual neurons and between neurons of different types and in brain regions and at the whole brain scale. To illustrate some features of the synaptome and synaptome architecture, I will show you some excerpts from these two papers, including the lifespan study published last week in Science. We developed methods to study the protein composition of individual synapses at a brain-wide scale. Synaptic proteins found in different complexes are genetically labelled with distinct fluorophores in knock-in mice. The localization and co-localization of these proteins allows us to identify the diverse synapses. And then brain tissue sections are imaged with a high-speed spinning disc confocal microscope. Um, from sections across the brain. And then using image analysis tools, we can classify synapses and we could catalogue as many as 37 excitatory synapse subtypes and then map their location, creating synaptome atlases. Here we see the areas of the brain colour coded to show the most abundant of the 37 subtypes in those regions. And here is a different kind of map which shows the diversity of synapses. Red and yellow is highest and blue is lowest. And it's notable that the areas of higher cognitive function, the hippocampus and the cortex, show the greatest synapse diversity. If we zoom in, um, in these close-ups of the somatosensory uh, primary visual and, and temporal association cortex, we can see that each area has a distinct synapse composition and that the highest diversity is in the most superficial layers one, two and three of the cortex. We also demonstrated that the synaptome architecture correlates with electrophysiological, structural and functional connectome measurements. Now, in our most recent study, we asked the question how the synaptome and synaptome architecture changes in the temporal domain. Now, the power of our technical approach enabled us to study brain-wide synaptic maps across all ages for the first time in any species. Here, we see the changes in excitatory synapses and synapse diversity with age. In the first week of life, there is very low diversity as shown by the blue colour. And that continues, and then there is a, an increase in the diversity that peaks at three months of age, particularly in the forebrain structures. After that, there are changes in diversity and regional composition that continue throughout the rest of life. Now, we noted that the brain regions in early life are more similar to each other and appear to differentiate with age. And this is better shown in these similarity matrices, where the similarities 
of brain areas is compared with one another. Now at one week of age, as shown in this matrix here, there is a lot of red and yellow indicating a high degree of similarity. But by three months of age, you can see that the similarity has diminished and that each of these brain areas has differentiated from one another. And it is their different synaptones confer specialization, which peaks in the young adult animal. And by 18 months of age, some of this similarity is now returning and regional specialization is being lost. So the brain regions differentiate between birth and young adulthood, and then gradually de-differentiate into old age. We refer to these temporal changes as the lifespan synaptome architecture. And as this graph shows, we can further divide this trajectory into three phases or epochs that broadly correspond to childhood, young adulthood, and old age. It's interesting how these lifespan synaptome architecture mirrors the trajectory of human lifespan psychology shown here, which also is known to differentiate and then de-differentiate with age. But we wanted to ask what kind of genetic program could drive lifespan changes in the synaptome with age. One candidate mechanism, which acts at the level of transcription at the lower end of the hierarchy, is known as the genetic lifespan calendar, which we identified several years earlier. Now the genetic lifespan calendar is a gene regulatory program controlling synapse protein expression at all ages. Just as the synaptome architecture is different at every age, at every age in mouse and human, there is a characteristic pattern of gene expression. So much so that it is possible to predict the age of a mouse or human, predicted age shown on the y-axis, by measuring the gene expression in a brain sample. I would now like to turn to the importance of this work for brain disease. So what has the synapse proteome and synaptome told us about brain disease? In the study that revealed the unexpected complexity of the postsynaptic proteome in 2000, we discovered that three proteins were known to be mutated in human neurological disorders. At that time, those proteins were not known to be synapse proteins. Thus, proteomics enabled the link to be made between the mutation and synapses. These may even be the first examples of human genetic diseases affecting synapse proteins. Realizing the potential that synapse proteins could be targets for many genetic disorders, we spent a lot of time identifying disease genes in our synapse proteome datasets and using the datasets in human genetic studies. This hunt turned up an astonishing number of genetic disorders affecting synapses. Our proteomic study of the human postsynaptic proteome in, in 2011 uncovered over 130 different neurological brain diseases. Our proteomic datasets have been used extensively by many human genetic groups for studies of monogenic and polygenic disorders. An example of a polygenic disorder is schizophrenia, which is now widely considered to be a synaptic disease. We first reported mutations in schizophrenia mapped onto the postsynaptic proteome in 2005, and this has expanded greatly in the intervening years. However, genetics alone does not answer key questions relevant to clinical management, namely where in the brain the pathology arises and when. All synaptic disorders have spatiotemporal features, including autism, schizophrenia, depression, and dementia. I will now show you how the where and when problem can be informed by the synaptome architecture. Synaptome architecture is modified by mutations. This is a phenomenon we call synaptome reprogramming. Now, the mutations acting at the base of the hierarchical assembly can then exert their spatial and temporal phenotypes. Here are several examples where synaptome architecture and lifespan programs reveal where and when 
genetic diseases affect the brain. Synaptome mapping of schizophrenia and autism mutations in mice reveals where and when the phenotypes occur. Here we are, a mutation in schizophrenia and intellectual disability, and here is one showing the change in the phenotype with a temporal domain. Combining proteomics with genetics can show which areas of the human neocortex are impacted by disease. And combining genetics with the genetic lifespan calendar reveals how schizophrenia risk genes could time the onset of psychosis in young adults. Together, these results show that the basic molecular architecture of the brain can explain when and where genetic diseases act and produce their behavioral phenotypes. However, to understand how disease synaptomes cause the behavioral phenotypes, we need to answer a fundamental scientific question. How are thoughts and actions stored and retrieved from the synaptome? In the following slides, I will show you a summary of an exciting new molecular model of behavior. The idea is that information is written in maps of diverse synapses, and this information is read or recalled by patterns of neural activity that activate the synapses. You will recall this diagram which showed that the postsynaptic responses of a synapse are controlled by its postsynaptic proteins. And when we have three synapse types, each with different proteins, they have different responses to the pattern of activity. Now we install these synapse types into this little synaptome map and present it with the pattern of activity. And as a result of the synapses having different physiological properties, the synaptome map generates a sequence of physiological outputs. This has two important implications. It shows a synaptome map can store many representations and that temporal information is stored by the synapse proteome, potentially capable of programming behavioral sequences. A synaptome map could generate outputs like this during a behavioral sequence, creating a continuously changing output, a kind of mental movie that reflects the underlying synaptome architecture. Now it follows that these outputs would be different if the synaptome architecture was modified as it is with age and with disease. And as I showed you earlier, the synaptome architecture does, in change, does indeed change with age and with disease mutations. And here are the electrophysiological simulations of a synaptome map outputs in response to a theta burst pattern of activity in age and in disease. This could explain how genetic diseases lead to behavioral phenotypes at particular ages and in brain areas. Now, nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. So finally, I'd like to show you one of the most fascinating insights that came from studies of the synapse proteome, how synapses and the synaptome architecture evolved. Synapse evolution began in early prokaryotes about four billion years ago with the evolution of postsynaptic signaling proteins and complexes. Some of these proteins, pathways and domains are conserved all the way through to modern synapses found in humans today. These molecular mechanisms in these unicellular organisms control essential adaptive behaviors. And then, two and a half billion years later, there was an increase in proteome complexity, as well as the origin of the vesicular mechanisms that later gave rise to the presynaptic terminal. So all major classes of proteins that make up the synapse evolved before neurons or multicellular organisms, which is why we refer to this ancestral molecular machinery of the synapse as the proto-synapse. Within the early, within the, uh, with the origin of multicellular organisms less than a billion years ago, 
The protosynapse machinery was then integrated into the first neurons and to form the synapse, synaptic junctions. Then a remarkable increase in synapse proteome complexity occurred around about 500, billion, 500 million years ago in the Cambrian period or thereabouts, which dramatically increased synapse proteome complexity, giving rise to the highly complex proteome found in vertebrate synapses today. This synapse proteome expansion event occurred before the radiation of vertebrates and before the growth and encephalization of the large brain that we have in mammals. And we now know that it was caused by a genomic mutational event known as two-hole genome duplications. One duplication gave essentially two copies of the genome and a second duplication quadrupled those ancestral copies of the genome. The consequences of these duplications uh, are shown here in the context of the hierarchy that I've described for you. And you can see that as a result of multiplying up the copies of the genes, there are now more proteins, more complexes, more synapse types, indeed more synaptome maps, and indeed more disease genes themselves. And we have shown using genetic experimental approaches that these duplication events gave the organisms with these duplications greater physiological and behavioral complexity. So in conclusion, I have shown you how simple and ancient molecular mechanisms have given rise to the complexity of the brain and our behavioral repertoire. I believe the concept of the synaptome architecture will become increasingly important in the years to come and open up new frontiers for basic and clinical science. I also feel strongly, I strongly feel it's important to disseminate data openly and freely, which we've done for the last 20 years with our G2C websites, which contain many different types of data sets, and more recently with our synaptome mouse atlases. But finally, I want to acknowledge all the people behind the story that I've told you today. The work was done at Edinburgh University and the Wellcome Trust Sanger Institute. And I'm indebted to all the members of my lab who did the work presented today and to my many external collaborators who are not listed here. I want to give special thanks to my long-term colleague, Dr. Noburu Komiyama, who joined my lab more than 20 years ago. And also to the funding agencies that have so generously made it all possible. Thank you.